Hello, everybody. This is Dr. B, and I'm here with the second video for Module 14. Uh, first of all, you can see behind me the USS Eisenhower aircraft carrier. Uh, aircraft carriers are amazing uh, ships and just phenomenal uh, engineering that goes into those. I have that there because of, well, there's a buoyant force acting on it, which amazingly is able to hold up the weight of not only the ship itself and all the people on it and all the equipment, but also all of these airplanes. It's just incredible. Just to give you an idea of the weight involved, the uh, aircraft carrier has an anchor, maybe more than one, I'm not sure, but the, the chain to hold the anchor is, well, it's heavy for sure. And to give you an idea of that, each link in the chain weighs about 136 pounds. So, Anyway, think about that for a second. Um, all right, well, let's get, well, before we get started, we'll take a look at my t-shirt of the day, which is not a science shirt. It's a Master Yoda, and he gives some free words of wisdom. He has these nice little tear-off strips here, and get some good wisdom, like fear is the path to the dark side. Named must your fear be before banish it you can. Uh, you must feel the force around you. All right, and all those were free. You're welcome. All right, now let's get into some true false questions. All right, so this is meant to see what your understanding's like at this point. Uh, you can follow along on page nine of your student note packet, and I encourage you to pause the video, write down your answers to at least the first three questions. Uh, you can you could go ahead and do all of them if you want and then you won't have to pause at the later ones. All right, pause now. Okay, welcome back. So first one, milk, water, oil, and air are all fluids. That is 100% true because all liquids and all gases are fluids because they flow, they exert pressure through the random motion of the molecules and atoms in them, they exert a buoyant force. So we group them together in this category called fluids. Number two, if you have a piece of metal and cut it in half, the density will be half as much. That is false. When you cut it in half, it has half as much mass as the original, but it also has half as much volume, and therefore it has the same density. Okay, Density is an intensive property, which means it doesn't matter how much of the material you have, it's still going to be the same value. All right, number three, SI units of pressure are kilograms per cubic meter. That is false. SI unit of pressure is the Newton per square meter, which is also called a Pascal. Kilogram per cubic meter is the SI unit of density. All right, go ahead and mark your answers down for number four and five, and then when you're ready, come back. All right, so the air around us exerts pressure on everything it touches, but that pressure is small and can be ignored in most instances. That is false. Okay, this one's tricky. First part of it's true, but that pressure is not small. If you thought that pressure was small, maybe you weren't paying attention in the first video when I went over how the pressure acting on here, 15 pounds per square inch, and we figure out how many square inches there are. And so that ends up being over a thousand pounds of force just from the air. All right, number five, pressure of a fluid changes the deeper you go into the fluid. Just when you thought they were all gonna be false, this one is true. P2 equals P1 plus rho GH. Don't have to memorize it. You just have to see it on your equation sheet and understand what it means. All right. And remember, P1 will often be the atmospheric pressure. If you're finding the pressure at a certain depth of fluid, like in a lake or a pool or an ocean or something. All right. Rank the buoyant force for each case from smallest to largest, clearly indicating any ties. And no, you're not going to send me a direct chat message. Sorry about that. <laughs> Missed another. All right, so point force is smallest on this one because the object is not yet submerged in the water. It is displacing some air, so there is a small point force from the air, but very, very small because air's density is so low. Um, here, a little bit of point force, a little bit bigger point force, a little bit bigger point force, and mm, same point force. Okay, both of these are fully submerged. And then they're both displacing the same amount of water. So same buoyant force. All right. Um, 
Oh, and don't pay any attention to the water levels because the water level stays exactly the same all the way across until this picture. I don't know why I didn't make that image. So I'm sorry about that. It would be nice if the water level got a little higher, a little higher, went all the way up to here and stayed the same for those two pictures. All right. Uh, number six, the buoyant force on a fully submerged object changes the deeper you go. False. That's what D and E is showing you. Well, it's not showing you, but that's what we talked about. All right, number seven and eight. Uh, the buoyant force is calculated by multiplying the object's density by the acceleration due to gravity and the submerged volume of the object. That is false. Okay, buoyant force equals rho GV, which, oh, by the way, it's another way you can tell here that the buoyant force does not depend on depth because it's not rho G vh or something it doesn't have h in it so it's not, it doesn't depend on the depth whereas the pressure does depend on the depth p2 equals p1 plus rho g h h is right in there but for buoyant force it's not there all right so again using that equation buoyant force equals rho density times g times v sounds right except that you don't use the object's density you use what density that of the fluid it's the fluid's density because the fluid's density times the, the volume of fluid displaced, that's the mass. And then you multiply that by the acceleration due to gravity and then you get the weight. All right, so seven was false. Number eight, the buoyant force is always calculated by multiplying the fluid's density by the acceleration due to gravity and the volume of the object. False, okay? Got the density part right, acceleration due to gravity is right but it's not always the volume of the object because it could be that only part of the uh, object is displacing fluid. It could be partially submerged, like a person sitting in a bathtub or like that object on the last slide right here in B and C, you would only use the submerged part. So if we combine these, if we use this part, submerged volume of the object, and we combine it where we're using the fluid density, then that's the right way to say it. So both of those are false. All right, now let's do this one. Yeah, switch cameras here. All right, this matches up to what you have on page seven. I was trying to print it out yesterday and my printer got very upset with me. It got jammed, I undid it, and then it wouldn't print. Um, so I just decided to handwrite it. Here we go. Um, we're gonna look at these free body diagrams for four different scenarios. And we're gonna divide it in half, basically, because these two are both for a tennis ball. And we're gonna do them with this one first and then that one. So if you take a tennis ball and you push it underwater, then what's going on? You know, if you put it, well, most people know if you put a tennis ball underwater, it's gonna come back up to the surface. So the tennis ball has weight, and the tennis ball has a buoyant force acting on it. And the buoyant force must be bigger than the weight. And it accelerates upward, okay? As a net force upward. Okay. Once it gets to the surface, how big's the weight? Is the weight smaller than before, bigger than before? Nope, the exact same size. What about the buoyant force? Does it have to be bigger than the weight to float? No, it does not. It has to be equal to the weight. So the buoyant force was this big, and now it's this big. And now the net force is zero. How did that happen? Well, before the whole tennis ball was underwater. So it was rho, density of the water, times g, times the volume of the tennis ball. But now, a little diagram. Okay. The tennis ball is only partly underwater. Okay, so rho density of water times g times this volume here. So that's why the buoyant force is less. It's displacing less water. Okay, so you can see it adjusts. Okay, we had another adjusting force, which was static friction. Well, the buoyant force will adjust as well for objects that float. Drop them in, they bob up and down, and they come to the rest and they have net force of zero. 
All right, now let's look at a rock that is sinking. Okay, there's a rock. It has weight. And what other forces does it have acting on it? It has a buoyant force. But the buoyant force is not as big as the weight. So it has a net force downward. <clears throat> Pardon me. What happens? Well, it keeps going down. It keeps getting faster as it goes down. We are ignoring drag in, in these two, okay? This one and this one, we could include the drag from the water, which is substantial, actually. We're gonna just leave it out of this simplistic analysis. Okay, it gets to the bottom. Now there's weight. There's still the buoyant force, but there's also what? It's sitting on the bottom. So there's a normal force. And the net force is now zero. All right. So these free body diagrams really kind of give you um, a really good idea of how to draw free body diagrams when buoyant force is involved, four different scenarios. Um, and you can see again how this free body diagram would change into this one and how for a sinking rock, this free body diagram would change into this one once it hit the bottom and the, the net force was zero, now the acceleration zero. All right, well, I hope that helped you. And as always, come see me in office hours, send me an email, ask me questions, and uh, I'd be glad to help you.